how do your spiritual gifts manifest in everyday life? And what spiritual gifts do you even have? Well, I recently had the opportunity to host the Tamara Scott Show on Lindell TV, and one of my guests talked about this in our interview. We talked about apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. We all have one or more of these giftings. Understanding how God has wired you and these spiritual gifts in your own life will do more to give you an understanding of yourself and what God has called you to do than any personality test that you have ever seen. And I believe this interview can be a launching point to take you to a new level in what God has created you and called you to do and prepared you to do. We dive deep into these gifts so that you can see how they show up in your life and how you can advance God's kingdom, whether you're at work, at home, in the culture, or at church. And the second guest I have on the program talks with us about big tech censorship and what they are doing to fight back. This is an incredible episode. You're not going to want to miss any of it. Let's get into it right now. Welcome to the Tamara Scott Show. I am Ryan Howard in for Tamara Scott today. We have got a very powerful show for you. I think you're really going to enjoy it. we got a couple of high-powered guests. It's going to be an incredible show today, and we're going to be talking about your calling and your assignment, and we're also going to be talking about the free exchange of ideas, and we all know that censorship has been a big theme in our culture in America and around the world, really, over the last few years, and so we're going to tie all of this together so that you can see the part that you are to play in in what God is doing today, and that is in the culture, in the marketplace, in the church, in the home, all around. And we are called to be an influence to advance the kingdom no matter what we're doing, and that includes every sphere of society. Now, I'm going to talk with two guests today, and I'm going to introduce them here in just a little bit. One is a pastor from Florida, and the other is a filmmaker from down in Tennessee. Now, before we get into that, before we get into the show, I want to say a quick word about our sponsors. The first is MyPillow, and we have a promo code, Tamara, for a great savings at MyPillow.com, MyStore, or MyCoffee products. When you support MyPillow using promo code Tamara, that's T-A-M-A-R-A, you can save up to 80% on great products that bless you, your home, and your family. But you also help us share truth across the globe. The Tamara Scott Show works hard to bring you great guests and present truth in ways that you may not find other places. And it's an honor to have you use promo code Tamara. Now, the second sponsor we want to thank is Bella Grace Elixir. Bella Grace Elixir offers three key ingredients to help bring health from the inside out. In 2022, Bella Grace Elixir won an award for helping with cognitive function, and in 2023, Bella Grace was awarded as a startup star in athletics for outstanding new ingredients, formats, and benefits shaping the sports and active nutrition industry. This is a product for both men and women. So you can use the QR code on the screen to save 10%, or you can use the link to mara.bellagraceglobal.com, and you can get that free and just pay the cost of shipping. So it's uh, a lot of great products here that you want to make sure you go ahead and take advantage of. Now, back to the idea of calling and assignment. Now, we all have callings and assignments. And first of all, we're called to know Christ, to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And after that, we have what I call secondary callings. And they're Not less important, but they're only important after the first calling is fulfilled, after you know Christ. And then you can step into the assignments and the callings that God has for you. And we have this all throughout the Bible, whether it's simple activities or whether it's some big lofty accomplishment that God wants you to go after. But I remember when I was uh, out, I gave my life to Christ in 2004, and I kind of thought, well, I have to become a pastor because I'm serious about Jesus now. And it was some years later when I was in my work that God showed me I don't have to feel guilty for enjoying my work. Now, of course, we needed to be doing righteous work, and we need to be doing work that honors God. But I saw that he actually had a calling for me in business. And I saw this book called Anointed for Business, and I thought, those two words don't go together. But I ended up finding out they do. They go together very well, and many of us have those kinds of anointings and callings. And I ended up doing my Ph.D. in biblical studies, and I did my dissertation on how God uses work of Christians to advance his kingdom. And that can be in the culture. That can be in the marketplace. It can be 
at home. It can be taking care of kids. It can be in education. It can even be in politics. I know that uh, may be tough for some to believe, but praise God that he calls some of us to do that. And so I could see how God wanted to use me right where I was. And that really helped me to lean into. Now, God may be using you where you are. He wants to use you where you are, and he may be taking you somewhere as well. But knowing that truth can help you really lean into the calling and the gifts God has for you. And there's two key Bible verses that I want to sort of set the stage with here. And the first is 1 Timothy 4.14. It says, do not neglect the gift you have. Now, this is, of course, Paul writing to Timothy. But the question is, what gift do you have? Well, we're going to talk about that first on this episode. And the second verse I want to bring to you is 2 Timothy 1.6. It says, and again, Paul writing to Timothy says, For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you have a little campfire and it's starting to die out, you got to do something. You got to put kindling on the fire. You got to ruffle it up a little bit. You got to get the flame going. And that's what we need to do. So often we sit there and wonder why God's not speaking to us, but our Bible's collecting dust on the shelf. And we're not actually seeking him. We're not spending time in solitude. And what we need to do is get that Bible off the shelf, and we need to see that God wants you to be engaged and have him engaged in every detail of your life. And that is just the incredible blessing that we have to serve God. And so that brings me to our first guest, Mike Patz. Now, we're going to talk about how uh, God gives us these callings and how those callings can manifest themselves in the workplace, they can manifest themselves in the marketplace and in church as well, but it's not only in church. And so, Mike, if we want to bring him on, uh, Mike is the pastor at Greenhouse Church in Gainesville, Florida, and uh, he has a heart for discipleship. And that's one of the things I just really love about Mike. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, do we have Mike on the line here? Yeah. Hey, Mike, welcome. Ryan, what's up? Great to see you. Yeah, thanks for joining us on the Tamara Scott Show on Lindell TV. It's uh, great to have you on. And I was just mentioning how I just love your heart for discipleship. And you you lead a very large church down in Florida, in Gainesville, Florida, Greenhouse Church. And one of the things I love is that you're replicating. You are at you you have such a heart for discipleship, and you're planting micro churches. And really, the boots on the ground. It's really where that's where the boot where the the rubber meets the road. And so. Give us, uh, we want to talk about APES, this idea of these uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. These are gifts that uh, people often associate with church, and some of them are more obvious than others and more straightforward. But what we want to talk about here is to give a little introduction to this, and then we want to show how these can show up in, in our everyday lives, and it's not only at church. So give us a quick introduction to this, and uh, and we can go from there. For sure. By the way, it's great to see you, Ryan. Last time I saw Ryan, we were playing some pickleball together. He's uh, quite the athlete running around, so that was fun. But I'll I'll say this. I keep hearing people seeming to be very interested in finding themselves. You know, I, I'll meet people on the street. Everyone's trying to find themselves. It seems like every year there's a new personality profile book or something like that that comes up where everyone's trying to figure out what was I wired to be or who am I that kind of a question. And so there's a lot of uh, talk on like right now, a lot of people are into the Enneagram. They want to find out the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs or people take disc tests. There's all sorts of personality profiles and tests that people take. I've just been really intrigued in scripture that Ephesians 4 tells us that God has, he's wired into humanity these, these really, I, I don't know what you would, I don't know if you want to use the word calling or it's a gift or uh almost positions on a field is how I think God does these. But when you've got the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, and the teacher, I think it is not just positions in a church or in religion. I believe these are part of how God has wired us. And I, if, if I were a business leader, I would be wrapping my business personnel around how God did things. So this is not just religious. This is, this is human. Like this is a, a human kind of thing. So a lot of people I know have really tried to get into like the Enneagram, which would be like this ancient idea of nine personality types. And they'll tell me I'm an, a, a challenger, which is like type eight, type, type threes are achievers. There's all these different things. And there's Myers-Briggs and you've got the different things that people do to try to figure out what they are. 
What I find interesting about God is that I believe that from creation, like hardwired into humanity, he's put, he's coded us with apostolic tendencies, prophetic tendencies, evangelistic tendencies, teaching tendencies, and, and shepherding, ten, I'm sorry, shepherding and teaching tendencies. And I've just watched it work, you know, so yes, we do this at our church. We even regularly have meetings where we try to make sure every one of these five voices has been heard because people will tend to make the best decisions when they've, when the full a pass is coming out. And again, a, I'm just using a pass for apostle, prophet, uh, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher, a P E S T. Uh, but it's not just religious. Like th this is very much, uh, I think applicable. And if I was a marketer, if I was running a department, if I was a teacher at a school, uh, or even in my house, your if you've got children, your children have probably already been. Uh, there probably already are the signs of what their APES giftings are. And I've just watched people come alive when they use their gifts, and I've watched people not come alive when they're they're trying to do someone else's gift. Well, and that's a great introduction, and I think that it's. One of the things that is – there's two things. One, what gift do we have and, and how do we know that? And we'll yeah. talk a little bit about how what stands out to that. But what I really like was yeah. we, you, you brought this idea. I remember we were just sitting at this mastermind we were at, and you started talking yeah. about how – these can be out of balance. You can have maybe two or three without the other two, and it's not going to grow, or it's going to grow in the wrong way, right. or it's going to be, it's just not okay. going to be deep. And how you have to have all these together. And what really threw me for a loop, and I said, man, I got to go deep. We got to talk about this, was when you said, and I believe that's not only for church planting and church growth and discipleship, but in business and in education and all these other areas. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then you started talking about, how these gifts manifest in these different areas. And I thought, well, th I have that. I have that. I know this person yeah. has that. And oh, that. And then when you when you shed that light on there, I think, well, geez, there's these three projects and this business initiative we started up. And that's why that didn't work. And that's why this one worked. And that and you can just you can see. So give us a yeah. glimpse into kind of how these gifts manifest themselves and, and how do they show up? Well, I I mean, maybe starting with the defining some terms is going to be helpful, you know? So apostles, even in church world, there's a lot of debate about things like, hey, are there modern day apostles? And if if by apostle we mean someone that saw Jesus raised from the dead, no. Like, we don't have that. But the word apostle, like the, the Latin word for apostle, I believe was like the word missio, you know? So like when we use a word like, we say things like missionary. So a lot of church denominations will say things like, the only apostles these days are missionaries. And what they mean by that is that a missionary is someone that's been sent. It's it's a missio. This is where we get the word missile. So like a missile is a clearly sent object. It's being sent somewhere. Well, that's what apostolic people are. They are on a mission. Apostolic people, these, I, I think they prime the pump for entrepreneurship. I think they um, develop capacities for taking risks and going to new places and breaking new ground and things that are like that. So that's what apostles do. Apostolic uh, church people, they go become missionaries and they go become church planters and things like that. Prophets are a little bit different. Prophets are, of course, the, the word prophecy in scripture just means someone that's speaking forth and specifically speaking forth a message from God, not just a, a foreteller, but a forth teller. But what I've found like a prophet when they're in a meeting or in the boardroom or something like that, prophets, they tend to give self-critical insight to an organization, to their employees. Hey, how are we doing as a church? Or they've got insights. Hey, this department, what do, what do we need to hear right now? They, they safeguard from missional drift and things like that. Uh, evangelists, and it might be helpful if I use my in my hands for this, I, I tend to think of apostles like the thumb. You, you really need apostles to found things and start things. Prophets are like a pointer finger. They tend to point us, hey, this is what I think God is saying, or this is what we need to hear in this organization. And again, even if you were an atheist listening to this right now, I think you could detect the genius of how we believe God has set things up. They point things out. Evangelists, and I won't do that finger alone, but evangelists are like the, the middle finger. They tend to draw a lot of attention. They, uh, they're, they're like the marketers. They, they naturally develop an invitational and a welcoming culture. Um, they develop the stickiness, the simplicity to the message of whatever that organization is. You know, so if if it is something that is like a 
Uh, if it's a church, they're inviting people to that church. But these are they're, they're going to naturally like recruit people to the cause or to the product or whatever that is. Shepherds, I believe they're almost like the ring finger. They're very they're very humanizing. They're like the ring finger. You know, they're just they're very faithful. They 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 make I don't know the the human element get very real. They're about relationships. They they're looking out for the marginalized, um, not just in the world but also in in a church, but in an organization. These are the human resources people. Like when human resources is done well, that's a very shepherding, a very much a shepherding kind of function, ensuring that um, properties. Uh, the, the the rights I should say like the rights of the employees are being taken care of that, that I don't know that's the, the shepherd they, they care for the people and then teachers they're like I, I compare them to like the the little finger they're small enough to get in your ear that when they talk they're like oh I I get it I understand it now and and I can really see what's going on but these are the people they develop resources they get policies going um, they get programs for continued learning. Um, they're very committed to knowledge transfer in an organization. So obviously in Ephesians 4, when Paul says God provides the apex for the building up of the body of Christ so that the body of Christ can become fully mature, that does apply to the church. I would just submit to you this also applies to other organizations. This this also applies to uh, whatever business that you're in. And what any room I go into, I'm often interested to figure out right off the bat, one of my first questions is, where are the apostles? Where are the prophets? Where are the evangelists? Where are the shepherds? Where are the teachers? And in an organization, I want to know that all of these voices are being heard. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, I think it's it's incredible to just see how these gifts show up because certainly everybody watching this can see themselves in one of the fingers, one of the apes that you mentioned, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. And I think that, you know, what about people who maybe see a little bit of, maybe a couple of them stick out to them? Is Can there be overlap? Could you talk a little bit about that? Or is it, nope, pick one totally. and then stop talking about it? How about the others? Yeah, you know, I mean, now this is a little more observational, you know, so I don't have a Bible verse that says, you know, thou shalt identify uh, the two positions for each person. But I I like to use, I'll use letters regularly, and I'll use a, uh, a capital letter, and then I'll use a lowercase letter. So I'll actually do both of those. And for example, I, I lead a I have a, I lead a church, but I also planted a micro church, and so we've just got like a church that meets in my house, um, which is you know another kind of conversation. But we try to go plant things, and we try to reproduce things, we try to multiply these things. Well, one of the first things I I do when we kind of launch something like that is we go around our group, our our little church, and find out. So in my micro church, we've got about twenty or twenty five people. I want to know what everyone's a pest giftings are so that I know how to do this thing, you know? So in our micro church, uh, I'll, I, we, we have three or four people. They are apostolic. In fact, a couple, there's, there's two CEOs that are in my group. They are capital a apostles, you know, now I buy that. I don't, again, I'm, we don't use this on a title. We don't put this, just use the word apostolic. Okay. Cause people really freak out We're, we don't identify. We don't walk around asking and demanding anyone give you a title. Um, but they are, they are ca- like one of the guys, he's a capital a apostle and I would call him like a lowercase t teacher. Like he's an apostle teacher, right? Uh, another guy's like an apostle shepherd. Like he's just got such a sweet shepherdness to him. But but he's also a he's an apostolic, you know. Uh, I have known people. I believe the apostle Paul was clear. He obviously he was an apostle. He was also a teacher. He called himself a teacher to the Gentiles. He was an, clearly an evangelist. He was he was evangelizing the cause of Christ more than anyone else in his day. He obviously had a shepherd's heart, you know. So. Uh, I think he probably was, it seems like he was prophetic. I mean, you know, Paul might've had all five of these going on, you know? Um, but I, but I look at people, like there's one guy I have in mind. I had a conversation with a guy today. As far as I could tell, he's straight up teacher. I don't know that he has anything but teacher. There's other people I've met that have some combination of all of these, but I have often found it helpful to tell me, I'll ask people, Hey, what's your top two? What's your capital? What's your lowercase? And again, that's just, that's just a Mike Pat's philosophy. That's just how, how I handle things. But if I'm in a meeting, like I'll just tell you how it breaks down in meetings. I'm regularly in meetings where I've heard the prophet speak, the prophet spoke, the pro- uh, this prophet, that prophet, that prophet spoke. I'm like, okay, we need to hear an evangelist now. Like now we need the evangelist to speak. Uh, and, and I could break this down in a lot of different settings. I lead a church. So like as an example, on a Sunday morning church service, 
uh, a lot of times the prophetic people, they just want the presence of the Lord. They're like, they, they just, they're interested in heaven and they're thinking about heaven and the presence of God. And they want, and they, these are the people during worship, they'll let it go super long and let it get really juicy and all this. But then the evangelist will be the voice of like, hey, what the heck, man? We've got people in here that have never heard the gospel. Uh, they look all uncomfortable. They're about to go walk out before the, the message even comes. And, and I'm, I'm interested when it comes to looking at a Sunday service, I want both my evangelist and my prophet to speak. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this brings into sort of having these in balance and, and the detriment that can come when, when they're not in balance, that you really need all five of these. And I think, you know, we've had other conversations and I've seen some different resources that I think you've put out that talk about how you can identify sort of where it might be veering and how you can kind of make sure you have the balance that you need. And if somebody See, I mean, I started out with a verse about fanning into flame these gifts. And so if somebody, you know, people watching this are thinking, OK, wow, th this is this is new for me. Or maybe they're thinking, oh, they're being reminded of this. And OK, yes, I need to I need to do something with this. So what should people be doing? What, what's like a next step to sort of put gas on the fire or fan it into flame and, and to stop neglecting this gift that they have? Well, for one thing, I think you go and. And you think about it. You you actually ask yourself the question, hey, I wonder what gifts I have. And if you are in community, I think you ask other people, hey, what gifts do you see in me? Uh, one of the biggest flames I've seen is when people see those gifts in other people. There's a guy in our microchurch that uh, multiple of us went. He's an evangelist shepherd. He might be equally both of those. But we told him that, you know, and he's like, oh, no, I'm not a shepherd. And everyone's like, bro, you are a shepherd. You know, shepherds, they're very protective and they're strong and they care about people and they and, and they just watch out for people. They, they These are like the, you know, the mama bear kind of people, you know, and and uh, it took other people pointing that out to him. Bro, you are a shepherd. We need you using that gift. So so one of the things that happens is when when we at least even you have this common language that we can use, I think we ask people about that. You can read on it. You can read things. You can just literally Google search. Hey, what are what are apostolic people like? What are prophetic people like? And maybe you use words like innovators and entrepreneurs for apostles and and uh, evangelists and marketers and salespeople. And I think, like you said, you fan and deflame that gift. If someone's a singer, they don't just take it for granted they're a singer. They work on it. If you are uh, a salesman, you go to sales trainings and you work on that. The bummer to me is when I watch people that have a gift of teaching and they don't work on their gift of teaching or they've got a gift of of shepherding and they don't work on their gift. If you're a Christian, you pray about this. You say things like, God, I feel like you've called me to be a shepherd kind of person or a teacher or an apostolic person. Lord, I ask you to show me, lead me in paths of righteousness. What does that look like? Ask other people, find books that are on the subject. There's a guy, an author named Alan Hirsch that writes a lot about this. There's a book that's called 5Q, which talks about really kind of like there's IQ. He would say 5Q, like the fivefold. You know, where are you at with these fivefold? But I just want to emphasize, you also need all five of these in your life. The danger I have seen is prophets tend to hang out with prophets and evangelists tend to hang out with evangelists and apostles tend to hang out with apostles and church. If you go to a church, the American church is almost exclusively shepherds and teachers only and has not had the rest of the apest in action. A lot of mega churches have an evangelist that's preaching. But other than that, Scripture makes it clear when you're exposed to all five you're going to come most alive. So I would even ask you, are you being exposed to all five of these in your life? Because if you're not, you can go read books. I mean, even right now, you know, Beth Moore, she's a teacher. You know, if you if you're reading this person, they are you can you can tell what authors are. You start to look at people like that and make sure that you're getting all five of those exposed, your soul exposed to all five. Well, that's good advice. And I think that I like how you talk about not only on the larger scale with what we're seeing we want to do and move forward with, but also on a personal scale. And that's something that that's that's new that, that I think just even people speaking into your life and making sure that you're you're understanding from from all those different perspectives. And I think, you know, you talked about equipping and maturing and that sort of thing. And I think there's so much uh, separation. Uh, maybe it's unconscious for a lot of people of spiritual and non-spiritual things. And, and one of the things that I talk about on my podcast a lot is 
that there is no separation. I mean, it there it, that's not biblical. In the Bible, it was all one thing, and even wars that they went to, and even uh, you know whatever it was, whether it was the church exploding and spreading, or, or the Holy Spirit coming, or whether it was you know New Testament, Old Testament, everything. There was no separation, and that's sort of a, a modern day thing, and it's kind of come and gone throughout history. But I mean, we know you know these teachers and these sorts of things are are to build people up for the work of their ministry, and I think that. So many people, when they hear the word ministry, they think of whatever they're doing at the church, but in the four walls of the church. And and for sure, that includes leading small groups or planning churches and that sort of Thank thing. You. But and, and it includes, ha- you know, creating, making coffee or being on the welcome team or worship team. But right. it doesn't it doesn't only include those things. So could you talk about how sort of maybe you help equip people for the work of their ministry that that might happen yeah. outside of Sunday and outside the four walls of the church? Well, I'll give you an example. One of the guys that's in my microchurch, he is apostolic. He just is. He's the CEO of a company that does extremely well. I mean, the guy is just killing it. Everything he touches goes very well. But he never, you know, like, where do apostolic people go when you go to church and they're they're signing people up? They're like, hey, can you help us pass out bulletins or collect the offering? But this guy, man, he's, he's an innovator and he's an entrepreneur and he starts things and he takes new ground and he does all these kind of things. Well, it, as it turns out, like we've just asked him to start praying. Like, what are you supposed to do with your business? He he's actually using his business to plant workplace, like pl- really plant churches in his business. By that, I don't mean four walls, and I don't mean calling it First Baptist or First whatever. I'm saying I'm saying he is doing his business, but he is making disciples where he is and planting the church in his realm. Like that is what he's doing. So. So we try, and I, I one of the things I feel called to do is to help people figure out what their call is. How do you use your apostolic gift or your teaching gift or your shepherding gift or your prophetic gift right there where you are? How do you faithfully live that out? Because that's going to manifest God's kingdom wherever you are. If you're like a Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego, who in their realm that they lived were excellent and they were being a blessing wherever they went, a blessing with excellence, bringing fruit, being productive and fruitful. And that was to the glory of God. And they were they were ministering for the Lord, but that you would not have called them in ministry. They were in politics or they were in the public sphere, but God used them there. So wherever you are, you need to pray and ask God, Lord, how do you want to use me? I, I absolutely I, love I that. Absolutely it, love it. It, I think that we so often have like I like we talked about that separation and we it, for me I remember this epiphany I mean I remember where I was sitting I was actually sitting at this desk and I saw and and when it's God opened my eyes like you didn't miss it like you're where I want you so like lean into what you're doing now and just and and, and invite me into it more and partner with me and you know God gave me solutions God gave Joseph solutions to tough problems that other people couldn't solve and he's given me solutions to problems to fix relationships in the workplace or to move projects forward that were stuck that 10 hours on Google didn't help me, you know, and, and it had to come directly from the Lord. And I even did an episode called ask God more often than you ask Google. And so there's, there's a, a place for that for, to get more information. But then there's a time where it's like, you got enough. You just need to spend time with the Lord and seek God. So let's bring it home with seeking God. That is a staple that, that when I think Mike Pats, I think, you need to be serious about seeking the Lord. And it's like your thing, you know, a past and seeking the Lord. That, and so talk us, tell us a little bit about that uh, here and, and give an encouragement for people and, and how they can do that and, and, the, and the power I mean, of 100%, that. And again, it, this is another non-religious thing, but the theme verse of my life is Second Chronicles 26.5 about King Uzziah. So King Uzziah was not a priest. He was a king. You know, he was he was just in, you know, doing his thing. But it says about him, as long as he sought the Lord— God made him prosper. And I've just seen that happen again and again and again, that when people seek the Lord, I mean, if you're in business and you said, hey, what's your first piece of advice? I'd say, seek the Lord. As long as you seek the Lord, He, you're going to notice things you did not notice, and you'll see things you didn't see. You'll have peace when others are striving. You'll sleep better at night. You're going to have ideas pop into your head. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. So, I mean, I play that at our church. Any pastor in our church, they have to pray two hours a day or I'd let them go. You know, like uh, every mem- every uh, member of our staff, even if you're a secretary, you, you've got to spend an hour a day with the Lord. We're like, you're going to seek the Lord and I'll pay them to do it. But I mean, you're going to seek the Lord. But I tell people to do the same thing. And I've wa- literally watched people that were struggling, depression, you name it. They begin to seek the Lord, spend time. You just can't spend time 
with the good shepherd and not be changed. So if you'll seek the Lord, God's going to make the, what the hand, your hands do prosper. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I it's kind of like I, for me, it's like if I don't do if I don't prioritize it and like if I'm feeling a little dry and I'm sitting there and I can't come up with things and I just seem stuck and I seem and it's like I don't know what I'm going to talk about on the podcast or I don't know who I need. How do I get this project going forward? And it's frustrating. And it's like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to go pray and do a little worship and, and spend some time in the word. And then it's like after I kind of do that, seek the Lord, as as you say, and then it just sort of everything else just becomes clear. It's like I just have I know which direction to go. I know which path to take. I know who to call. It's just like I see it's like it lets the dust settle and I can see which direction to go. And I just have that kind of clarity. And it's like otherwise it's like trying to pour out of an empty cup. You know, you got to fill the cup up if you're going to pour it into someone else's cup. And we're sitting here not even filling our own cup. And so I've just noticed so much more direction when I do prioritize that. And it's like, like you said, a couple hours, I mean, and that flies by and you want more of that time when you, when you're getting into, whether it's prayer, conversational prayer or listening prayer, that's something that a lot of people neglect. It's like a couple in a car driving down the road, one's talking and then they're done talking they stop and get out. And it's like, well, what? the other one, you get, can I have a chance to talk? And so many of us treat our prayer life like that, where it's just us kind of talking and then we, we check the box and go do the thing. So what uh, as we wrap up here, what other uh, encouragements or what else do you want to share that that you think is important for our viewers to to know? Well, my passion is Jesus, you know, so I I, I, I saw the opening. So this is a, a faith based kind of show, I believe, you know, and I, I will just say, you know, sp the, the whole APES. I mean, I love APES, but the reality is the, the great the fulfillment of all of this is Jesus. You know, the, who is the apostle that left heaven on a mission? That was Jesus. You know, and who is the the prophet that speaks the truth and 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 predicts everything and speaks? It's Jesus. Who's the great evangelist, the good shepherd that saves the lost sheep and goes after, leaves the ninety nine to go for the one? It's Jesus. Who is the who is the ultimate shepherd? You know, that's protective of the sheep. That's Jesus. Who is the great teacher that speaks the sermon on the? I mean, the reality is. Every the the essence of everything we want is Jesus. You know, like the closer we are, the the better we draw near to Him. The more life is just going to be alive if we'll stay in Him, remain in Him. It's just going to be incredible. So, uh, my appeal would be uh, just re even if you disregarded everything I said about the a past or whatever, if there would just be passion for Jesus, what He's done, how He has done what He's done, and who He is, He's the secret to everything. Well said. I I saw on a truck in Brazil many years ago. It said Jesus is the answer, and I thought, well, well that's interesting. And yeah. the 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 more I sought God about that, the more I understood it. And then when you actually realize the Bible is a picture book, and it's a picture of Jesus in every single letter on the page, in every single story yeah. we have. So, Pastor Amen. Mike, it has been great to have you on Thank the you. show. We got your website on there. Is that the best place to to great. follow you and what you're doing, or anywhere else that that they should go? Uh, for me personally, probably Instagram, which is Michael Pats, or at our church website, greenhousechurch.org. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Mike, it has been awesome. great to have you on. Thank you so great. much for joining us. Awesome. See you later. All right. Wow. What a powerful discussion with Pastor Mike from Gainesville, Florida. He has got an incredible church, a thriving church that is growing and is reaching the students of uh, down there in Gainesville. Uh, it's just so powerful what they're doing and his heart to reach all of Florida, planting churches all over the place. And so you can see he's uh, got an incredible heart for discipleship and to help you grow and deepen your faith. And so I would highly encourage you to seek the Lord and uh, make sure that uh, you fill up your cup. Now, we're going to get into, before we get into our, our next guest, we're going to take this and talk about some censorship and some of the different things that are going on there. But I want to give another word to our sponsors. The first is MyPillow, promo code Tamara for great savings on MyPillow.com, my store, or my coffee products. And when you support MyPillow using promo code Tamara, you can save up to 80% on great products that bless you, your home, and your family. But also help us share the truth across the globe. So the Tamara Scott Show works hard to bring you great guests and to present truth in ways that you will not find elsewhere. So it's an honor to have you support the show and my pillow with promo code Tamara. Our next sponsor, 
Bella Grace Elixir. Bella Grace Elixir offers three key ingredients to help you bring health from the inside out. In 2022, Bella Grace Elixir won an award for helping with cognitive function. And in 2023, Bella Grace was awarded as a startup star in athletics for outstanding new ingredients, formats, and benefits shaping the sports and active nutrition industry. Now, don't forget, these products are for both men and women. And you can find the QR code on the screen there or visit Tamara.BellaGraceGlobal.com. Now, our next guest, I want to talk about, we're going to talk about, like I mentioned, big tech censorship. We're going to talk about how we have competing narratives between what the mainstream media is saying. And I know that the viewers of this show are no uh, stranger to the fact of censorship and to have the importance of getting us, we're going around that censorship today. And our guest is going to talk to us about how he experienced censorship with a film that he produced. Now, it's Matthew Thayer. He is the director of The Trump I Know. And this is a film that came out in 2020. And we're going to talk a little bit about how this film was put on the back burner right before the election. And wouldn't you know it, after the election, it, you were able to access it and get it. And the thing is, we're going to talk about how one, this censorship took place and what they're doing to combat that. And then secondly, we're going to talk about also how you can participate in an event that's coming up soon. But the thing is, you know, Matt, I've inter I've had Matthew Thayer on my podcast, which is called Cutting Edge Faith. And if you want to find more about me, you can go to RyanSHoward.com. I've got a newsletter there that you can you can get on. And I've got a podcast where we talk about the truth behind the headlines. We talk about what's going on in the world from a biblical perspective, current events, all those sorts of things. And I say to help equip your faith so that you can navigate the cultural chaos of today. And we started out this show talking about how your faith is not a separate thing. In fact, faith was foundational, even in the founda foundation of America and this nation. And so it's just in incredible to continue to go that direction. That's what we want to do. That's what we want to have is to keep our faith strong and to keep that as the foundation and to seek the Lord in everything that we're doing. And so we're going to be talking about how the censorship led to some of the difficulties and how we need to make sure that we are set up to not have that censorship uh, taking over. And the, the film, I'll talk just a little bit about that while we get ready to have Matthew on. You know, the film, The Trump I Know, if you haven't seen it, I mean, it really tells the story of who Donald Trump is from the viewpoint of the women who surround him. Now, the mainstream wants to paint a picture of Trump as, as a very negative and very anti-women. And, well, what we see and, – and this – this video shows, this film shows it's a it's bigger than Trump. It's about more than just Trump because it's showing that the mainstream narrative is not the way to go. And I think the viewers of this show are all critical thinkers, and you are smart enough to know that. And so we know, but this is incredible. It gives you a new lens to see to where you can compare – what the truth what, about some of the situations and circumstances that came up and what the mainstream narrative is saying. And you have a new lens to see. And not only in this little – this big example really of Trump, but you can see that lens will apply to everywhere else in life today where you can see what's coming from the mainstream narrative versus what is the truth. And so thank God we have eyes to see and ears to hear, and we have – men and women of God who are standing up and being bold, just like so many of those who are our examples in the Bible. And we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They, didn't, they wouldn't bow to the image. We see Daniel, who uh, would not stop praying. We see all of them taking a stand, and whether it was civil disobedience or whether it was just telling the truth, speaking the truth to power in their time, it, it this is nothing new. This is the biblical approach to things. And we do all of it in love, of course. You know, the, the, the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. And that's, I believe, 1 Timothy 3.15. And if you if a building falls down, and you what do you do? Assuming there wasn't an explosion or something, you investigate the foundation and the structure of that building. And so if truth is is being trampled in the streets and the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, 
What do we do? Well, what has been happening to the church? What has been going on? Well, we need to investigate that. And we see that the church hasn't done its job. The church has let culture go forth and sort of gone to the wolves, so to speak. And as Pastor Mike talked about, we have a lot of uh, shepherds and teachers in in the U.S. church, but we, we need more of the apostles, prophets, and evangelists, and we need to have that balance there. And thank God that it is coming in. We've had prophets and other people talking about how there is a shift taking place, and they're going to have these true men and women of God that are going to be coming to the forefront, that are going to be telling the truth about what's going on, and that are going to be not afraid of it costing them something, not afraid to have it be... Uh, something that's going to make a change in their life. And God gives us things, and we hold them with an open hand. And so we, God doesn't have to pry our fingers out, whether it's a job or a relationship or some hobby or whatever it might be. We hold it with an open hand because God can then remove it and put something else. And there are so many times in my life when I look back and I just see the patterns. I, I keep a journal. Almost every day I write, I've got a stack of journals and I keep track of things that God is doing and, and connections that he's made and prayers that have been answered and even prayers that have, have yet to be answered. And I can just see this pattern developing when I go back and look through these and I see how God is shaping something. And so God is shaping you. He's always preparing you just like he did with Joseph. You know, in Psalm 105, we, all, we know the story of Joseph who was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He was wrongly accused and thrown into prison, and then he was in. He honored God through all of that. And Psalm 105 says that that entire time, he was being tested. He was being tested. Think about that. Now, it was developing his character, not in the sense of he had a character flaw that needed to be worked out, but in the sense of sharpening and honing and 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 hardening and preparing. And, and getting Joseph ready so that he could be the man that God could rely on once he was in that position. And then he, so he didn't wait until he was in that position to be close to the Lord. So seek the Lord, seek the Lord, seek the Lord. That is just spending that time carved out in solitude. Now, Matt, I know, Matt, we got our guest ready to come on now so that we can bring him on and talk about his film, The Trump I Know, and some of this censorship that we have. So let's get Matt on up here, and we can go ahead and get started diving into this. So, hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Hey, buddy. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's great to have you on. You know, Matt's another good friend of mine, and uh, we're in a, another mastermind together, and it's just awesome to see. You know, we've talked about there's mega shifts changing in Hollywood and in Christian media, and yeah. we see some attempts from – the mainstream media and the mainstream elites to backlash against this. And your film, The Trump I Know, was uh, a fall, fell prey to that. But there is you're, you're not going to let that stand, and you're taking an approach to that. So give us a little bit. I mean, so you're Matt's an award-winning filmmaker. He's got some other films as well. I, the Reawakening series with Clay Clark is just absolutely incredible. I highly recommend that. And But give us a little flavor of the story of The Trump I Know and and sort of what happened there with in 2020. Well, the interesting thing about this is that this film was actually originated because of censorship. And if people remember uh, the film Unplanned, uh, I was a behind the scenes director on that. My wife uh, it was an associate producer and actually had a small role in the film. And when the film came out on uh, March 29, 2017, the Twitter account for the film uh, was taken down as a you know as a, as a glitch, and this was back before anybody really even knew that censorship was a thing, and so uh, it kind of caused a stir. Uh, people remember that, and a bunch of the filmmakers got called up to Capitol Hill, and one of those filmmakers was Joe Knopp, and Joe was a producer on Unplanned. And he, through a series of contacts, made friends with Laura Trump. And so he was invited up to Trump Tower, met Eric, hung out with Laura, and they were just swapping stories. And Joe's got this amazing, you know, just all American story of growing up literally in the gutters of Philadelphia uh, as an orphan, was never had a family and ended up becoming 
you know, a, a film producer, right? So it's just all this amazing, great American story. Laura loved that. Uh, she shared her stories of growing up in middle America and then, you know, meeting Eric Trump uh, one night on a whim, going out with her friends and ends up, you know, becoming a part of the Trump family. And so, uh, so Laura, so, you know, Joe, of course, you know, is listening to these stories, not just about Laura, but about the Trump family. And he's going, how is it that I don't know these stories as an American? I mean, why do I know more about the royal family than I do the first family? And so he uh, approached Laura and said, would you you'd be interested in us doing a documentary? And uh, and they were like, she was like, absolutely, that would be amazing. I'll open the doors, you know. And, uh, and so other than that, the Trumps weren't involved with this at all. They didn't pay us. Uh, they didn't, uh, they, they don't get any money out of this. It was all independently financed and, and funded. Uh, Joe rounded up some investors. We rounded up some investors. And uh, we set out to Washington, D.C. and New York uh, to, uh, to film um, Laura and then also some other, uh, some other people that she opened up the doors for. And then uh, we whipped it around. I mean, we turned it around in 90 days. Uh, we thought it was going to be ready for the 2020 election. And lo and behold, more censorship happened, as a lot of people are aware of now, in October of 2020. And our film was marginalized, was slow rolled through the process. And consequently, the film wasn't even available for people to watch until well after the election. And so really what this is, is people don't understand it, because, but it's election interference. And people don't understand the breadth of what inter election interference means. But, you know, election interference isn't just, you know, keeping people from the voting booth, you know, uh, you know, it's not just, you know, uh, what you would think when you think of election interference, you know, if people, you know, conjure up what images of that would look like, you know, we, now we're seeing it, you know, with these indictments that are happening with Trump, we, you know, we saw it with the Hunter Biden laptop. And sometimes with election interference, you actually don't yeah, know yeah. that something happened until years afterwards. And so our film you know, the suppression of that was sad because many of the people that shared the stories that they did in our film, some of the most authentic stories that you'll ever hear about President Trump, just extraordinary stories, um, they were all shared with reporters from the New York Times, with reporters from the Washington Post. And what would happen, the article would come out, they would say, ah, we talked to 19 women and uh, two of them, this is kind of what they said, and they'd spin it and make Donald Trump look like a complete a-hole. And the, the, the women would just shake their heads. And so when they actually saw our film and the way that we presented it, they came up to me with tears in their eyes saying, thank you so much for finally allowing our story to get out there. Now, the fact that this, the fact that this has taken a beating and the fact that all we're doing is just sharing stories about the president we're not attacking anybody and this film can't even get out there this should enrage the american people that that's a that's a great point i i think this it's not just a oh yeah well i'm glad i know that i can go watch the film and get the truth it's like like i said it's bigger i mean it's like like what you should be slamming your fist on the table like this is like are you kidding me and like yeah. people who said they literally wouldn't have voted the way they did if they knew about the Biden laptop, which which means they had the wrong sources for the news anyway, which is mistake number one. But I mean, I think you know, all of us knew about it, you know, and so, uh, you know, but praise God, though, I think the people are waking up and they're saying, well, I can't trust these people. I can't trust this mainstream media. And I mean, so you're you have come around. I mean, this I'm glad you mentioned Unplanned because that's another big film that was just an uh, incredible film that you worked on. And. But the Trump I know now you're re-releasing this. Tell, tell us about what's going. I mean, we know the the censorship, and, and this audience is very familiar with with that. And we know what happened. You've sort of mentioned that. But what's what are you doing now to re-release this and sort of and get this out now? Yeah. Well, so like I said, I mean, our our social accounts were taken down, and you know, when you're doing business, I mean, that's what it is. I'm, I'm in the filmmaking business, right? I am a filmmaker, I'm a storyteller, and this is what I what I do. And so when uh, when, I, when I go to people with a project and I say, hey, invest in our project, you know, we have a come with a plan, we have a plan of attack, and part of it is engaging in social media and marketing and getting it out there. And when all of a sudden you can't execute on the plan that you 
put in front of your investors, I mean, that that really sucks, you know, because it's like I, I can't even do what I promised to do because now I'm being stonewalled um, to get this out there. And that shouldn't happen in America. It just, just shouldn't happen. And so we've decided that we're just going to rein everything in. We're going to rein everything in and we're going to push everybody towards this event and where it's going to be in October. Um, and we're going to have basically a fight back against censorship and election uh, interference kind of kind of event. We're going to show the film. Uh, we're going to have uh, Laura Trump there, Devin Nunes, some of these other key people that are in this fight against this censorship uh, and keeping this type of content out from there. So people go to TTIKfilm.com to find out more information. We're still working on a firm date at this moment. We should have to land on that. Uh, here in the next couple of hours, but uh, we are working on the uh, uh, we're working on a couple of the guests, you know, their schedules and things like that, just making sure that we get everything aligned. But it's going to be explosive because we're pushing back against the the tech platforms and we're pushing it out to people directly. So it's going to be at a, at a live studio. It's going to be kind of where they did 2000 mules is actually where we're going to hold it and people can pipe in. Uh, there, it's not going to be able to be censored. People can actually interact live. There's an opportunity for people to ask questions. So it's going to have kind of a virtual town hall kind of thing. So we're calling it a hybrid event because it feels live, but people can pipe it into their living room, but still interact. It's a really, really amazing technology. And I think one of the things that I'm so excited about is not just for us, but it's for, for people that are in our situation. You know, I, I, I want to be a pioneer you know, to push this kind of technology out there in front of people and maybe other filmmakers or other people whose stories are being similarly suppressed, you know, can go, wow, we could do that too. You know, we could actually maybe do it that way. And because like, we just, we just heard that the Robertsons, I mean, the, you know, Duck Dynasty, I mean, these guys, you know, Duck Dynasty, like they can't even get a distributor for their film because it's Christian. And that's why Christians need to wake up. This isn't about politics. This is not about politics. This is this is about them silencing anybody that does not fit their narrative. And if all of a sudden you're calling a, you know, a he a he because he's really a he, all of a sudden now you're being stricken from the record. You you don't exist. And the sad thing is is that when people are, have the power to be able to do that, the people that would do something about it don't know about it because they never even heard about it because it's basically it's almost it's like wiping out a human being. It's a digitally it's digitally it's it's digital homicide. It's digital genocide. That is what we're dealing with, and we need to stand up, and we need to have opportunities like this studio and opportunities like this event. You know, like Sound of Freedom, right? Sound of Freedom. You know, eight years it took to get him out there, and finally nobody would touch it. Disney buried it, and finally all of a sudden, Disney uh, Angel Studios. Thank God for Angel Studios. You know, for getting it out there because now it's just gone all over the world and it's like wildfire, right? And so. You know, this type of a project, more more of a political leaning documentary, doesn't fit on, on their platform. So we're looking for other methods of distribution to bypass these gatekeepers that just have consolidated way too much power. Yeah, and I think this is, I mean, and I love, I mean, this is even a biblical approach because when the Apostle Paul, a Roman citizen, was beaten and he, he was thrown into prison and then they found out he was a Roman citizen and that's illegal and so they tried to let him go quietly and he said, nope, you're not going to let me go quietly. You need to take me out to the town square yourself. And so he knew his rights. And so for us, we don't just, when this happens, sit back. I mean, to a degree, yes, we should expect suffering. Jesus said we're going to suffer for the truth in his name and that sort of thing. And, and yeah. places like Iran, Christianity is exploding thanks to, and that's happening in the midst of suffering. And so... Yeah. That's something that we we are taking a stand. We're fighting back and doing these sorts of things. And so, maybe so you told us where we can get in touch with that. Maybe what do you see coming, for, you know, for in the future? I mean, what do you see coming in in media? I mean, we talked about on an episode on my podcast the future of Hollywood and Christian media and some of the shifts taking place where you have the instead of it being a, an agenda now it's the Christians are getting that it needs to be a story with an underpinning like like the chosen and Hollywood is going the other way where they're making it more about an agenda and who cares about the story so what do you see coming as overall here we got a few minutes left as we wrap up well I mean the encouraging thing biblically is the fact that um, the God has set up the world, the universe, uh, so that once you take him out of the center, it creates a literal black hole that everything just kind of just gets sucked into and eventually nothing exists. 
And so, oh, I'm getting a note right now that we have October 26th confirmed. 100% confirmed. October 26th is when this event is happening. So go to tthikfilm.com and you can get more information on that. So October 26th, it's going to be explosive. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so, but, so anyway, going back to the whole black hole, hole thing, God has or actually created the universe so that when you take him out of the center, everything comes to nothing. You can see it in philosophy. You can see it in art. You can see it in, I can point to a bunch of different examples. And so Hollywood, I'm not surprised because they've taken God out of the center. They've taken the God out of the center of education. They've taken God out of the center of government. Look at what happens. And so what's really exciting is that, like you pointed to The Chosen, I think some of the things that Angel Studios is doing is extraordinary. And people are gravitating to it because eternity resonates inside of the hearts of men. Because even though you can take God out of the center of, of, of things, and even though you may not believe in him, you still have a conscience, and there's something in there, there's a God-shaped hole there, right, that we've talked about that cries out to him in certain, some form or fashion. And so when we see that kind of void out there, we are repulsed by it naturally, because that's the way God created the universe. And we are drawn towards authenticity. We are drawn towards story. We are drawn towards things that make sense, because that's the other thing is that we're problem solvers naturally. And so when things don't make sense, we're looking for answers because we are royalty. We are, we are when, when the heart of the king search out of the matter, right? And so the heart of the audience will always search out a matter and going, wait a minute, hold on a second, things don't make sense here. And so now I think there's an opportunity for people like me, people like Dallas Jenkins, some of the other, you know, uh, the, the Sound of Freedom team to begin to, and all, a bunch of other people that we know that are creating some extraordinary content that, I mean, they're writing right now and there's, people are, there's, there's it's going to be a renaissance and it's going to, and they're making it easy on us because the, the garbage that they've been creating is creating such a stark yeah. contrast that when all of a sudden we push this stuff out there, people are going to go, wow, that's legit. Well, well said. Well, Matt, it's been great to have you on, and uh, thank you for all these insights and letting us know about this event. And you heard it here, hot off the press, October 26th, so make sure you go and get your tickets so that you can participate. So, Matthew, it's been awesome having you on. Thank you so much for joining the Tamara Scott Show. Thank you, buddy. TTIK.com. Be there. We'll see you there. Well, to our listeners, thank you so much for joining. You're listening to the Tamara Scott Show, and I am Ryan Howard in for Tamara Scott. You can find more about me at RyanSHoward.com, and you can get my podcast, Cutting Edge Faith, on YouTube, Rumble, and all the podcast apps. So thank you so much. Again, I'm Ryan Howard in for Tamara Scott. God bless, and we'll see you next time.